Welcome to the Newbie Real Estate Investor Podcast. I'm Jonathan Boyle with my co-host Joey Chan. And hey guys, we got some great news for you guys. Yeah, so we just actually partnered with the Results Only Mentorship Program. Hit us up if you want more information. Today we have special guest Tommy Macero. Hey. Welcome to the show. How are you? Good, good. Yourself? I'm doing great. Awesome, awesome. All right, great, Tommy. Uh, welcome to the show. And I have a couple questions for you. First of all, we want to find out what you did before starting in real estate. What was your previous like before real estate? So before I got into real estate, for the last 20 years prior to real estate, I was a chef and a restaurant owner. So I opened up restaurants from 1997, you know, or I was even longer than that. What year was it? Yeah, I think it was around 97. I started my first restaurant in Atlanta. I moved down to Georgia and opened up a restaurant, a New York style restaurant, pizzeria, bagel shop, deli, and um, you know had that restaurant for about seven years. And I moved back and forth from New York to Atlanta mm. while I was running that place. Wanted to hone my talents a little more and I knew that the education, I needed the education. So I went to culinary school after owning my first restaurant. Oh wow. And then started in my fine dining career opened up a small um, Italian restaurant in Jersey, and but knew ultimately I wanted to be into a, a New York City restaurant. So then I opened up a place called Tommy Lasagna, which mm -hmm. was a you know, pasta-driven restaurant, 80 seat, fine dining, tablecloth restaurant, bar. Um, we did a lot of catering, we did a lot of education, we were doing classes and, and things like that. And being in New York City, was able to build a corporate catering business and opened up a commissary kitchen in Williamsburg mm -hmm. where we were doing about a thousand breakfasts and lunch a day out of there to, um, to, you know, to companies. You know, mm -hmm. I had my clients, some of my clients were like LinkedIn and Amazon and Google. We, we would go to their office spaces mm -hmm. and, and take over space in their cafeterias or just in their office space. Like we had a lot of startup clients where they, you know, that whole transition in the corporate world was changing where they were trying to have that Google-like mentality in mm -hmm. their office, so yeah. they were providing everything. So I used to sometimes would go to an office three times in a day, like drop off breakfast, then go back, drop off lunch, and then drop off a happy hour at five o'clock, and they would have parties there and stuff. So that was fun, so I had that going. Then in 2014, my wife gave birth to our daughter. Nice. I knew that this business probably wasn't gonna be good for family life. So I wanted to get more involved in my, my family. So I put the restaurants up for sale and I always wanted to get involved in real estate. I actually, about 15 years ago, did some um, tax sales and burnouts in South Philly. Okay. And did a couple of flips there. I did, I personally owned myself three houses and then I partnered with uh, my dad and one of his partners and we did about 15 other units there. So we were buying tax sales, we were buying burnouts, it was, it was incredible. I mean, back then we were paying like $10,000 per property. Wow. <laughs> you know, they needed about 100, 150,000 in work and we were flipping out of them for a little over 300. Um, we bought a post office, tore the post office down, did a development, six unit development there. So we had a lot, I had a lot of that experience, but I, it was in the middle of my restaurant career mm -hmm. and it was difficult to manage everything. So. Right. But inside, I always knew that I wanted to get involved in real estate and investing. And I seen how much money the agent was making on the side of, you know, on my development side. Mm -hmm. So I knew, you know, the agent business was one part that I wanted to get involved in. So when I sold my last restaurant, I did a little quick spot in the corporate world. And I actually was running uh, the food hall in Newark airport for this company that held the, the, uh, the account there. So I was basically running 13 restaurants, you know, in the food hall in, in, in the United's terminal. Yeah. So I had 13 restaurants running three meals a day. You know, we were open from five o'clock in the morning until last flight, whatever that was, mm -hmm. you know, it could be one o'clock in the morning. So, oh, wow. and our concepts used to change. So I did that for a short period of time, but corporate world wasn't for me. I, I was always an independent restaurant owner. So yeah. really wasn't what I- it was, it was probably a little bit too restrictive, right? Exactly, and too much politics there, and you know, people don't like to hear the truth. You know, they like to be <laughs> stroked and caressed. So I, my my personality didn't fit in. So <laughs> when I left there, I decided, you know what? Let me get my real estate license. Let me learn the agent business. 
And fortunately enough, I chose, uh, you know, the right Keller Williams office because my mentor and my brokers are, yeah. you know, really into investments and it led me in the right direction. And now it's, it's actually going to be three years in March that I'm a real estate agent. Nice. Nice. So how did you end up finding that office or was it just pure luck? It was pure luck. I live in West Orange okay. and I actually spoke to a, a cousin of mine. She's been a real estate agent for 15 years and I asked okay. her advice, where should I go? Mm -hmm. And her advice to me was first stop is a Keller Williams office. They're going to give you the best training. They have the best platform for a newbie agent. You know, obviously like Remax are for, you know, more experienced agents and things like that. And she was mm -hmm. like, oh, come come to Remax when, you know, after you do a year there, you'll see and you'll come. And, I, and <laughs> I don't understand why anyone would leave a Keller office with the, you know, the technology that we have in place. Mm -hmm. But when I was researching and I Googled Keller Williams, yeah. I ended up skipping over the Montclair office and it picked up Clifton first. <laughs> Luckily, <laughs> you know, for me at least, yeah. I believe yeah. that it was very fortunate on my part because I didn't even know and I met with the team leader there, her name is India, and I t explained to her what I was looking to do and then she explained to me what our office has to offer because of what David and Maureen bring to the table right. on the investment side where really I haven't found another office that takes investments to that level. Mm -hmm. I knew ultimately I want to learn the business, I want to learn how to be a real estate agent, but I also want to learn, you know, how to get involved in real estate deals for buy and hold and fix and flips because that's ultimately what my long-term goal was. Right. Yeah, no, I, I definitely agree with you there. I was at another agency and I just actually switched over to your guys' agency. Yep. You're, you're one of us now. <laughs> <laughs> like the broker at that agency, anytime I asked him specific investing questions, I, like he was like, oh, we can't do that. That's not allowed. That's illegal. And it's like, how, how's that illegal? Like I've spoken to attorneys about it. I had like a very heavy dispute with him uh, on one of his like live like Q and A's before, and then he muted me on that. Oh so, yeah, not not all agencies are the same. So no, definitely not. And and that's that was the one key thing because like when I first started in the office, my focus was agent. I want to learn the agent business in and out. So mm -hmm. that you know, Keller Williams has a mentor program when you mm -hmm. become an agent when you're a new agent. My mentor was fantastic. You know, mm -hmm. she was a high producing agent and they connected us because our, so our personalities aligned because we do personality profiles there. Mm -hmm. okay. And she taught me, you know, everything that I know about the uh, agent side of the business. Mm -hmm. She was fantastic. It was, it's a vital piece, you know, mm -hmm. I'll always keep referring back to education because that's yeah. really to me what made sense. Even in going back to my restaurant career, you know, I had my struggles in my first restaurant mm -hmm. and I realized I had those struggles because I didn't have the proper education on the culinary side. And yeah. so I went to culinary school. Yeah. You know, I wanted to be an agent, so I went to some place where it's going to teach me. And that's how I keep evolving in my business. Got it, got it. So I, I, I know offline you mentioned this. So how many deals did you do in your first year? My first year in business, zero. I took on a couple of listings. I, I came into the business with a listing. Funny, in, in March of 17, I had my first listing, which was my mother-in-law's house in Hackensack. <laughs> took that in and I closed on that deal three months ago. Oh, it took what? me two and a half years to close that deal. <laughs> <laughs> that was my first, my first agent piece of agent business. Still paying oh, out my mentor on it. <laughs> But uh, it was because it was a development deal and it was a good education for me too mm -hmm. in what we're doing because the buyer was a investor and he was a developer in Hackensack and mm -hmm. what, it was a big 4,500 square foot house. He was looking to tear the house down and build um, rentals on it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So our contract stated that you know he was going to buy the house for X amount of dollars and he had to get a minimum of 10 units passed from the town. And part of the time frame was the fact that we were going to give him the time to get permits. Okay. So he was actually, we gave him the first, I think it was like six months. And then he started paying us back of like okay. 1500 a month. Mm -hmm. That wasn't going towards principal. Uh, okay. He was just because we were giving him the time. Okay. So okay. he was giving my mother-in-law money every month. And then we got to the point with COVID, it was taking a lot longer. 
the deal started breaking down for him because when we submitted, when they submitted, I seen the plans, they submitted for 21 units. Mm. I called him up, I'm like, mm. what are you doing? Like, you said mm. 10 units. He was like, no, 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 this is the process, you don't understand development, which I get, you overshoot, yeah. Yeah. you know you're gonna get cut back. Unfortunately for him, he kept getting cut back and cut back and we <laughs> ended up closing the deal. We negotiated down because we they ended up with 10, 10 units, uh, eight units, I'm sorry. Okay. Eight units, but now he still has to do all of the, the fire, the mm -hmm. sprinkler systems. Yeah, sprinkler. He has to do all of the sewer lines still, even mm -hmm. though he only got eight units. So, right. you know, I was talking to him a month ago and he was like, the deal is going to cost him a little over two million now wow. for eight rental, eight one bedroom rental. So oh it's a, it looks like it's going to be a nightmare for him, but you know, whatever. But it was a good lesson learned on development side that it's not to cut and dry. Right. You know, yeah. absolutely. Well, who knows, believe it or not, like, you know, everything's appreciating so much nowadays. Like, I was talking to a friend of mine. He was, like, he's selling, like, a two-unit in Belleville for 600 Selling a six-unit for, like, one, well, it's new new build, but he's selling it for 1.6. Wow. So, that's you know, Belleville. hack and, and that's Belleville. Yeah. So, hack and sack, I could only imagine how much it may be. Yeah, you never know, you know. So, yeah, so my first year was more education and... Coming from being an entrepreneur and knowing opening up my own businesses, you're gonna it's gonna take time. You're never yeah. gonna turn profits right away. So I was okay with it. Mm -hmm. I you know didn't make a dime in my first year in business. Did what I had to do, but learned. And then the second year, I was strictly agent, and did eleven. Mm -hmm. You know, had eleven. Still pretty you know, good. Yeah, for, decent decent business. You pretty know, good for an agent. You know, decent business. I was mm -hmm. you know I was content with it, but I I knew there was something more and. Being, I, I was very, very much the person to go to the office. I was in the office at 8.30 in the morning, would stay there until I had appointments. And I always would see David running around talking about investment deals. So last December, you know, I was looking at my goals because that's one of the things we do a lot in, in Keller with our team leader and stuff. We talk about our, they call it the 411 goals and mm -hmm. things like that and the 135s. So we were going over it and I was just... You know, I was like, you know, I want to talk with David. I, you know, I see, I hear what's going on, but I don't know exactly what he's doing. So I scheduled a meeting with David and last December and we sat down and I explained to him what I was looking to do. And he explained to me the platform that him and, and Maureen created, which is results only. And he was like, you know, I take on coaching clients and it's a, it's a really high level coaching mm -hmm. and mentorship that I, you know, I went to the, the, the highest level I can with him as far as what he does on a coaching level. And it was okay because I was an agent, I knew what I needed to do, and he obviously seen something that he believed I could accomplish the goals that he would put forth. And we started coaching, and that was December. Like January 1st was like really like, okay, this is what you need to do. Started learning from him and, you know, just, practicing the things that he was making me implement, telling me how to create deals. And we, we do a lot different. It's not just like a buy and hold where find a property, let's invest in that property and we hold it for long term. Mm -hmm. We become very, very creative in how we finance these deals and how we structure the deals because mm -hmm. we want to extract the most money out of them. Yeah. So there's a lot of different ways that we make that happen. So that was a part of the education in the beginning. And you don't know what you don't know, so you just listen and you do. Yeah. And then obviously in, Mar in March, the pandemic hit and we all went on lockdown and you know we had our, our meeting and, and kind of uh, my partner, John Kim, came into the mix also at that same time. He was part of the office on the technology side and uh, you know, mm -hmm. and he wanted to get more involved. And we, me and John used to have a lot of conversations in the office and the three of us, you know, really sat down on Zoom and hammered out a plan. And we were like, what are we going to do? How are we going to make this work? And one of David's biggest points was, you know, harder, stronger, buy everything, find them. Just, you know, so we went out there and utilized social media and people we knew and conversations and really started talking about, you know, how do we find deals? Let, show me what you have. And so our, the basis of our business is finding deals and finding investors. That's the two pieces. That's, that's our two goals. So we have a team in place that does a lot, you know, as far as the administrative side to help us grow our business. And, you know, we were just going over our goals uh, this morning, me and John, and, you know, this year we have 
one or two more closings before the year is out. But we, I ended up doing about a little over, I think, 30 or 31 transactions. But of those 30 or 31 transactions, we're uh, joint venture partners on 12 of them. So we ended up acquiring 31 doors for ourselves. And it's a little over $3 million in, in real estate value on the purchase side. That's not even the ARV yeah. side. So, you know, it's pretty impressive. And looking at the numbers, we raised a little over a million dollars to make it happen, too. Wow. wow. You know, in, and our first closing was May 28th. <laughs> so, so, so basically in like a seven month time span, really, that's incredible. Yeah. Congratulations. Yeah. So, thank you. Thank <laughs> you. That's amazing. So yeah, it's been exciting and, and we're just very excited for 2021 because you know, now that the vaccine is here, we know it's inevitable that we're on the, the trend of getting away from COVID and we know once we're able to get out there and really work effectively outside, mm -hmm. It should be something, you know, much better, much bigger. So we, we kind of doubled up on our goals for this year, you know. Yeah, no, that makes sense. What, what are your goals for uh, 2021? 75 transactions. So I, you, you can't see, but you can see on the wall, that's 75 transactions. Oh, wow. So I'm very visual. So I have a picture on behind my desk of 75 houses with address bars and purchase bars and, and realtor fees. Because we, I base my business around commission. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I, I, how I structure is I make my money to live off of real estate commission. That's why mm -hmm. I always tell any, anybody that we're coaching, because we do have a coaching platform that, you know, mm -hmm. newbie agents, wholesalers or investors into the platform. Yep. We always tell them, get your real estate license because yep. that's how I live. I base myself around my real estate commission and my holds. I reinvest into those properties because I have this five five year, 12 year, 15 year plan that I structured mm -hmm. where in five years, I want to acquire the total portfolio that I'm looking to achieve for my retirement. In 12 years, we look to have them start being paid off 100%. And in 15 years, we're looking to have that entire portfolio paid off. Wow. So that in 15 years, we 100% own all of the properties. And we're talking about between five and 700 doors. That's what we want to have in the portfolio. My God. And we want those paid off in 15 years. And we have that, that long-term goal in mind. And we have a plan to achieve it also. So I don't need to pull the, the, the rent rolls out. So yeah. we'll reinvest that money from the rent, the profits from the, you know, the positive cash flow mm -hmm. every month into the houses to get them paid off quicker. Because right. you know, if I could achieve this goal, we're probably looking at you know, making about you know, between 100 and 150,000 a month in positive cash flow after yeah. the 15 years, I don't know. I, I could, I think I could live <laughs> off of a hundred thousand a month. I, I, I think I, I don't Maybe, know. I don't know. Yeah, I think I'll yeah. be all right. How, how will you ever survive? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, no, I, I, I get that. That's uh that's an amazing goal. Mm -hmm. And you know, it makes a lot of sense because uh, that kind of like what you said uh, about your commissions that you basically live off that. And then everything kind of like just the gravy. Like my, my idea is kind of similar where all my flip money, is how like my fiance and I are living off of and all the rental money is just there for other deals or like eventually down the line to pay off the mortgage or something like that. Sure. And also, you know, rainy day fund, like, you know, things like COVID, you know, I know one of my tenants owes like 3,500, another one owes like 21. Like you have to plan for that as well. Absolutely. So. You know, you always need to have Everything needs to be planned out. Everything needs to be broken out. We always have basically three roads we could take in every deal when we analyze it, when we first take it in. Mm -hmm. You know, we have to be able to cash flow as is. We're not, we don't have to put a penny into it. So we cash flow that way. We could rehab it, refi out of it and get, you know, hopefully get 90 to 95% of our money, if not 100% of our money out of it. Mm -hmm. Or we could refi, you know, stay in the deal, put another partner in the deal and just buy and hold and take it long term. Or we could just sell it and flip it and right. be done with it. So, you know, we always know going in what our out is. Of course. If you don't know yeah. what your out is, you're going to have a problem. And yeah. that's, that's where a lot of investors have you know, come into their biggest hurdles because they don't have their outs. They just buy it and let's see where it goes. But they don't know all of the ins and outs of... Yeah, they don't yeah. have their exit strategy. Yep. Yeah, no, that, that act... Uh, you know, believe it or not, I had one where I had to use my second exit strategy uh, because, well, it wasn't even really an exit, but 
So I had a property, I have a property in Lake Opat Kong. It was the, it was bank owned. Uh, I bought it off the bank, but there was an oil tank leak. And based off the bank's insurance, they were doing the remediation and they said it would only take six months to remediate, uh, I guess like some chemical or whatever. Well, I've owned it for about almost two years now. <laughs> and it's basically an Airbnb at this point where, you know, it pays itself and, you know, I make a little bit of money on top of that. So can't really complain. Yeah. That... But uh, again, that wasn't my intent at the beginning. Mm -hmm. My intent was to buy it, renovate it and flip it and be done. Yeah. But, but it's good that you had your other exit strategy and you don't have to worry about it. And that's where a seasoned investor comes in. And that's kind of what we try to do with our investor clients. So a lot of our deals will partner with people. People that don't, you know, they have their job and, and they have their income coming in. They're looking for other alternatives other than the stock market or their 401k or something like that. Right. So they're looking to do have some passive income coming in from investments. So we'll take them on as clients, you know, we'll partner with them. So my company is, you know, we're results only as our coaching platform, but mine and John and David's company is Momentum Props. Momentum will take them in. Momentum. Yeah, I found that on uh, online. I was like, this is perfect. <laughs> so we'll take that in and we'll partner with them. They'll fund the deal mm -hmm. and we'll deed the property in the investor's name. We'll project manage, property manage, stabilize, and, and either be the agent to sell it or we'll manage it long term and we'll share in the profits. And we could do that over and over again. And it actually opens up the doors for us to be able to get to the goals that we have. Because ultimately, when you start investing in, in real estate, your funds will dry up eventually. You know, there, there's only so many houses you could do in a year. There's only so many, you know, I don't care how much you have. You, it could be $3 million, mm -hmm. you know, that, okay. So, you know, 15 deals you could do in a year and yeah. you're going to dry up your, your accounts. And we always look to creatively find ways to make that happen for the investor and for us. So if we could turn around and do 30 deals in, in a year and partner on them, I don't need to own a hundred percent of one yes. when I could own 50% of 30, you know, so that's where everybody gets a little greedy. Sometimes they don't mm. understand that. Like you don't need hundred percent ownership. You could, you could fractionally ownership own things and be able to still succeed in it. And that's, yeah. we're yeah. trying to do some of that stuff too on the, on the finance level. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. I mean, uh, all my, almost all my properties are, you know, JV partnerships, mm -hmm. you know, so I have only one, that's, you know, I own with my wife. That's about it, you know? Mm -hmm. And then besides my own personal residence, sure. you know, but all my other investments, whether it's flips, whether, you know, we do a wholesale, whether it's buy and hold, it's all partnered. Yep. yep. Yeah. Yeah, same, same here. Yeah. Think uh, my original personal house, my personal house now, the Airbnb, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> Everything else, partnerships. Like the, the thing is like, I know in the bigger pockets podcast, Brandon Turner once said it and it stuck with me. 50% of something is better than hundred percent of nothing. Absolutely. Yeah. And we, we live by that, you know, I mean, David, he has a tremendous portfolio, but he'll still continuously look to do deals on a JV level. It's just, mm -hmm. it just makes sense. Yeah. You know, cause you, you could do, you know, tremendous amount of deals. And that's the greatest part about being living where we are and investing where we are in Northern New Jersey. You talk about bigger podcast podcasts. I listen to those sometimes and it's like, you know, around the country, they're very satisfied with two, $300 positive cash flow a door a month, <laughs> you know? And it's like up here, it's like, we'll never do that deal. Mm -hmm. You know? So we yeah. have the benefit of being in Northern New Jersey, so close to Manhattan where we could do, you know, 800 to 1200 is my sweet spot yeah. per property. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we could be at four, you know, three, 400 a door, but we're not buying singles. We're, we, our criteria is two to four family. Right. That's what we yeah. like because Jersey, once you go over four, it's commercial, commercial, and it's got different laws that could be, you know, you know, rental laws. So we, we rather stay in our sweet spot of two to four family. Yeah, no, that makes sense. And yeah. with two to four units, yeah, ta like, as a single family here in Jersey, taxes pretty much kill almost any cash flow mm -hmm. for anything. Like, I, I know, again, going back to my Lake Opat Kong property, if I rented it out, 
I would be losing money or breaking even every single month, like if I rented it out the normal way. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So, so you guys are doing one in uh, in Wildwood now. Like, how many units is that? It's four units. Four units. Yeah. It's a four unit. It, it's pretty much almost the similar criteria as you guys. You know, um, it's it's actually a three family in the front and a bungalow in the back. Mm -hmm. So that you know, that's how it's uh, structured. structured, basically. And you're gonna Airbnb that whole property? Um, initially, because we we have we're we're gonna inherit existing tenants, so we're gonna even look to kind of get rid of them little by little. And then once once we you know get rid of them, we're gonna renovate completely, uh, basically Airbnb it. And then once tenant leaves, then you know we can come in, renovate, and then put it put the Airbnb in each unit. Yes, it's it's all about creativity. Like we just closed Friday on a property in Sussex, New Jersey. You know, it's about forty five minutes west northwest of here. I went over to the property yesterday and met with the owner to pick up the keys and all of that stuff and he gave me and it turns out on the property so it's a it's a three family in the front it's kind of similar to you guys and then the back has a three car garage with an apartment above it oh. but when i was there i was talking about snow removal and landscaping and i didn't realize how big the property was to the right of the garage and it was a big it's a big open grass patch mm -hmm. so i was like oh i was just like looking at it with the owner i'm like yeah this is this is like kind of wasted space he was like well as a matter of fact i had intentions on subdividing he goes and i started the process so the town is going to allow another two family house on that property oh. so i was just like you know could you provide me those documents and gave me a whole envelope yesterday so half of the battle is done so wow. i got pretty excited about that because <laughs> now i'm going to put another two family on yeah. there which something we got to all talk about yeah did, you, did yeah. you know about that beforehand or not before i had the idea when i was there doing an oil tank sweep okay and i was looking at i was just standing on a property i was like i'm gonna build something on that and then when i said it to him he was like well as a matter of fact gas and water is running right down the back <laughs> so it's there so I was like, this is a no brainer for yeah. me, you know? So, you know, I'm basically, you know, have the dirt for free and I'm, I'm probably going to, I'm going to look to do a modular on it because okay. it's a long-term yeah. rental. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't want to stick build. I built modulars. Actually, my dad and my brother-in-law built modulars years ago in Clementon, New Jersey. Oh, okay. And I watched the process and I always believe that, you know, for a long-term hold, it's a, it's, it's a better product because of the weathering. And yeah. I just, yeah. I truly believe it. a lot of people disagree with me, but I know that when we went to the factory, you go to an uh, airplane hangar to watch these things being built yeah. and you know, they're being built in this perfect environment and they're sealed and they get delivered to you, you know, wrapped yeah. and they're done. Like toilets are in, carpets are in, floors are in, <laughs> cabinets are in, everything. So, well, yeah, I, I've had a little bit of experience, you know, as, as a, as a contractor, um, coming into you know, like finish it up for, you know, the builder, right? You know, at right, it's basically you have your foundation and then each room or each section of the house gets craned in mm -hmm. slowly, you know, boom, boom, boom. And, and then the roof finally, and then everything gets kind of locked in. Yep. So I kind of come in after that process, you know, so I come in, you know, along with the electrician and everybody else, they, they, they connect every floor, every, every area, all the plumbing gets reconnected. Uh, so I have to come in, I fix all the tiles that, that end up getting break, broken mm -hmm. along the way. Um, the countertops get put in, you know, the doors uh, come uninstalled, so we have to install all the doors. Any like cracks on the uh, a drywall, you know, we come in, spackle that, fix it up, things like that, you know, so we come in and do all the finishing touches of that. So I've seen that process. Yeah. You know, and what's yeah. cool about it is, is like, you know, when you start, you, you know, shovel goes in the ground for foundation. It takes about three months to get a house delivered. Mm -hmm. So in that three months, you're doing your foundations, you're, you know, you're, you're doing your, your sewer lines, your water lines, your electric, you're running all the services to the house. Yeah. The house gets delivered. I mean, your process from when you get the house to delivering it to the owner, what is it? A week? Uh, yeah, pr roughly like a, a, a week or two. I would say probably like closer to a month. In, in so you're looking at four months yeah. and you have a completed house ready to go. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I've never did a stick built house from, mm -hmm. you know, ground up. So I don't know how long it takes, but I think it's it a little bit longer. It takes about six to eight months, depending yeah. on the amount of volume, you mm -hmm. know, the builder is doing and how much, 
luxury it is. Yeah. How luxurious mm -hmm. it is. You know, if it's if it's like a typical three hundred fifty, four hundred fifty thousand dollar house where you know it's not super luxurious and the finishes aren't you know as crazy. Yeah. You're. It's probably going to take closer to like six months. Mm -hmm. You know, from foundation to mm -hmm. completion. Yeah. So. Yeah. I just like the whole process of it being done and watertight, you know, so, so, and for me, you know, the values, I know the values are a little off on, you know, as opposed to stick built, they put a, a higher price tag on a stick built house as mm -hmm. opposed to a modular. But yeah, for me, my long-term plan is never to sell anything. Like I, yeah. I, can't, I, I feel like I lose money when I sell a house, you know, I'll flip, I'll make a bunch of money. But for me, I, I look at it as what, what's the 20 year plan? What's the 30 year plan? What's, uh, you know, the legacy wealth. That's that's what I look for. You know, mm -hmm. generational wealth. You know, if I could put this portfolio together in 15 years, my daughter could do whatever she wants in life and not have to worry about, well, how do I pay my bills? You know, yes. if she wants to be a concert pianist and it takes, you know, 20 years to get there, she never has to worry about money when you're a long-term buy and hold. Right. You know, you come from that background. Yeah. Flip, yeah, we could enjoy our lives and we have that money and there's a place for it because our plan is you know to have those properties in place but still do 30 to 40 flips a year too mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know so it's it's both sided because you know i you always hear a lot of people and it makes me laugh when they talk about you know you need multiple streams of income like all oh, oh, TikTok or anything you you, know, you gotta have you gotta be a, a an amazon you know seller or <laughs> whatever, whatever it is you gotta you know sell candy, you gotta do this, you gotta do that. I look at it, yes, you need multiple streams of income, but our process, we have this multiple streams of income in one business, you know? So Momentum Props has seven streams of income coming in. So to me, it makes sense. I could focus on those, yeah. you know? Like a lot of our coaching clients now, the younger guys, the millennials, they're options trading. It's a big thing now. Everyone's learning how to options trade and they're all getting involved in it, you know, but at one time I was a day trader, you mm -hmm. know, back right. in the nineties, yeah. I, I used to tr day trade stocks. And if you're not hundred percent laser focused on it, you're going to lose. Yeah. Same mm -hmm. thing with options trading. If, if it was that easy, everybody would do it. And, and then when you really drill down into what you're learning online, these guys are options trading penny stocks. They're not options trading, you know, Tesla. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they, you know, you're yeah. doing penny stocks where, yeah, okay, you invest twenty five dollars and maybe you'll make two hundred dollars. But where is that going to get you in the long run? And how much focus does it need to take? I know you could set stop losses and all of that stuff, and and that's fine. Mm -hmm. But you still have to do your research. Yes. Yeah. In my way, you know, when I work with clients, you know, our streams of income come from doing deals with them, from flipping houses, from wholesaling deals, from commissions, from education, from merchandising through momentum. So that to me makes a lot more sense when you have one focus. Yeah, of course. Absolutely. You know, so, but you know, everybody has their ways of doing things. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, I get it, I get it. So, um, Tommy, I do have a question for you. Do you have any uh, audio books or books in general or like podcasts that you listen to that like help you in your real estate or just in business in general? Podcast, I was, I, in the beginning I started listening to Bigger Pockets, but it kind of, I kind of shied away from it now because of my coaching. You know, I, I kind of, my podcasts are my coach. You know, he's, he has so much information, so I'm talking to him three times a week, so I like to bounce things off of him. And I like, I like mentors more and, and people that I could talk to one-on-one -on -one as opposed to, the podcast of listening and education, because I think no matter what business you're in, success is driven one way and there, there's a certain kind of person that is successful and a certain kind of person that has the drive. So I'd much rather speak to successful people that I know and I'm very fortunate to have some successful people in my life that I could bounce ideas off. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I do try to, you know, wasn't a big reader growing up and I made a conscious effort to have a goal of reading, you know, uh, a, a lot more. A lot of the the millionaire real estate investor is definitely a good book. You know that model with Keller Williams. The one thing from Gary Keller is a really good book. Uh, I just started that book that we were talking about. Yes, remarkable. I think yeah. Remar I just started it last night, so I'm reading that. That's interesting in the beginning. But I, I definitely lean more toward documentaries about athletes. That was you know mm -hmm. the Last Dance was super inspiring to me. That that ten ten episode series on Michael Jordan. Okay. I, I, I just, I, 
was blown away by that kind of drive and reading the first chapter of Remarkable, it, you know, kind of leans towards Kobe Bryant mm -hmm. a lot. And I just think that athletes have a certain level of drive that I would much rather learn about what what's behind what they do, you know, yeah. and how they do it. Like I have a friend of mine whose nephew went to Fordham University, played football at Fordham just recently. He's, he's 23 years old. He graduated Fordham in three and a half years, playing football the whole time on a full ride scholarship, got his degree. He got, he's been in his last two years now, bounced around the NFL to five or six different teams, oh, wow. bounced on practice squads, getting cut. And, and I'm like, you have somebody that's young, he's 23 years old and still could have that drive in him to, to get that abuse basically of being bounced around you like so close to getting on the team and then the last day you get cut and like to keep your mindset yeah focused i was about to say the, the, prize, the mentality it, <laughs> athletes are, are a whole different breed so i think this year one of my goals is to start looking at more biographies and on on athletes and and try to understand what what their vision is and how they do it you know because you look at some of them i mean like Shaquille O'Neal, I just seen a blurb that he owns 1,500 car washes. Oh, yeah. And he has, you know, obviously the Papa John's thing that he's doing. And I then, think he owns a few, like, other franchises too. Yeah, he's like, big in that. Uh, Magic Johnson, huge with movie theaters and malls. Um, and even Alex Rodriguez, he's one of the largest holders of rental properties. He has like 15,000 doors. Oh my God. <laughs> I didn't yeah, know with that. With a company out of Manhattan. I, you know, he, he invested in this company like it wasn't, you know, obviously they, these are investments mm. for these guys, but they put, and, and, and I think everything leads back to the, the coaching part and the mentor part because they don't, they don't do things outside of what their job is when they're playing the sport. You know, like David will always refer to a pitcher. A pitcher is only good at pitching. He could bad, he could do it. Mm -hmm. But he's not good at it. But he could throw that ball, you know, and it and it's unbelievable how he could throw a hundred mile an hour hard ball at you know at a, a, a you know a target this big yeah. and hit it. But even though the seasoned veterans, what do they do every day? They practice. They'll go out and throw a thousand balls. You know, they they don't say I'm a master at it. They are a master at it, but they still they're a master at it because they practice. Mm -hmm. You know. Michael Jordan in the last dance after a game was over and he had a stellar game. He was back in the gym that night for another two, three hours. So that mentor and coaching part, it'll always make you succeed in life, I, I believe. And, and that's what's the most important part of, of building this business. Yeah. You have to have that. And we do it to each other. I mean, listen, right. you, you guys got more involved in our platform now yeah. and you guys are doing more, but you know, when I'm looking to do that, 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 you know, development deal, of course I'm going to talk to you guys and I'm going to coach with you guys to learn that. Yeah. You know, you're never greater than the people around you. And, and once you understand that, you're always going to learn and you're always going to succeed. Absolutely. Yep. You're the average of uh, your five best friends or, you know, five people you talk to the most. Yep. Absolutely. So with, with that being said, what is the best piece of advice that you've, you've gotten? You know, one of my uncles, when I called him up and told him I was going to be a real estate agent and basically, you know, turning my career into being a salesperson, mm -hmm. which my uncle has a tremendous sales business, you know, he was just like, one of the things he told me that resonates with me is you got to be a killer. You got to be a killer every day. He, his salespeople, you know, they have a huge, tremendous, successful business. They're killers every day. They're relentless. It doesn't stop. You know, you, you. You can't put your, take your foot off the gas. I mean, I, before you got here, I, I knew I had this today. I was here at seven o'clock in the morning because I knew I had to straighten out some deals. Mm -hmm. I'm going crazy because I, I, I have a plan of how many deals. I need one more deal before the end of the year yeah. to at least put it on the contract. It's driving me crazy. I was miserable last night because the deal fell through and I didn't get it and I'm waiting on it. You know, but I'm, I'm relentless at nine o'clock at night. I'm texting people, you know, and talking to people. At five o'clock in the morning, I'm researching deals, you know. It's just part of wanting to succeed in life, you have to put the work in no matter what. And, you know, being a killer in the sales side is very important. And, you know, what David always tells me is it doesn't stop. Like, David pushes and pushes in a very good way, and yeah. it really helped me get to my goals. I mean, we got to these goals sitting in house. 
it's amazing. You know, <laughs> it's that's, so that's, yeah, that's what's shocking about it. It's like, we, we were trapped in a house. Like, I, I, we don't see people. Like, you know, you, like today, you walked in, nice to meet you. Yeah, I know you for a year, over a year, and it's like, nice right. to meet you because... <laughs> we've know, never we, we met never, in person. We never see that. Like, we've crossed paths at, you know, at, at Nick's events and things yeah. like that. But that's the crazy part. And I was able to build rapport and relationships. It's it, The other thing, it's about respect. No matter what, if you are happy with your deal, if you're not happy with your deal, if the deal goes south, you got to have respect for people. You got to still, I'm, I'm a very big respect person in the side of, you know, there's always a please and a thank you. There's always that level, no matter how big or how small you are, doesn't matter to me because you never know how big that small guy's going to get. And yeah, when right. you have that good rapport with them, mm -hmm. you know, sky's the limit of what you could do. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that, that, that just brings me, you know, a, a quick thought, you know, we had, we had our old, uh, I would say like previous camera guy, you know, and he, he really became, you know, like, uh, I guess like uh, a monster, right? Uh, like he really blew up, you know, in the last uh, year or so, you know, but just like that dedication, striving for, you know, to get deals and just always wanting to get more knowledge, mm -hmm. you know, and just just going at it, just keep going, yeah. you know? So, yeah, he's doing fantastic too, you know? Well, that's really why we good. built the coaching platform, yeah. you know, yeah. because uh, it's, it's Finding deals is one thing, but we, we have our coaching platform, which we sell memberships to where, you know, a part of it is, is having firsthand knowledge of the deals that we're bringing in for their investors. But the other part is, you know, just having that group of like-minded individuals and experienced people that could really teach you you know the the ways to get there right you, know, you can learn listen everybody you have a brain in your head you can learn how to do something you could read books you could figure it out you could take your lumps lose money on deals i look for the easier path the easier path is the education yeah and and that's why we started you know david started results only coaching and that's why me and john jumped on and i think that's kind of what you guys see too in yeah. the long term you know when our conversations about the education piece it's important, you know, and that's the only way you're going to really take it to a high level. Absolutely. Of course. I want to thank, you know, you very much, no, Tommy. Thank you. Thanks, Tommy. Appreciate it. Podcast. And uh, guys, don't forget to like and subscribe to the podcast. Uh, have a great time. Take care, thank everyone. You.